This conference will now be recorded. Hey, uh, Councillor Moore, before I start, take, take the screen down for me, please. Councillor Moore, before we start, can you unmute and let me know if you can hear us? Yes, sir, I can hear y'all. Okay, thank you, Councillor Moore, for, for joining us. Uh, at this time, we will call the meeting to order. It is 4.39 uh, p.m. Let the record reflect uh, that uh, Councillor Arnold, Councillor Janine Cornbest, Councillor Moore, and myself are all present, as well as other staff that are here on the road chart. I would uh, entertain an approval of the agenda. I make like a motion to approve. Go ahead, Councillor Moore. I'd like to make a motion to the approve the agenda um, for May 22nd, 2023, and also the minutes for the previous meeting. We have a motion to approve the agenda. Second. Any discussion on the agenda? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. Were there any uh, concerns on the, the minutes? If they will stand as, as presented. Non-action items for the project updates. Your project updates next slide. In your project uh, packet, I mean the packet you have the project update, the dashboard report. Today I'm going to kind of highlight the inclusive park because it's moving along pretty good. Uh, the feature you see is the what we call the two to five year old. As you can see, it's a ramp, so it'll be wheelchair accessible. They're putting in the playground equipment. Should the equipment should be in this week? But then you still got to put in all the playground surfaces where they're going to fall on when the kids come off. But that's the two to five year old. Next slide. That's the five to 12 year old from a drone. Uh, what's pretty cool to me, I haven't seen one, is you have a seesaw right here that's uh, ADA acceptable. So the kids can get on a seesaw. I call it seesaw. And that's the five to 12, next. Next, this is the sensory garden. So as you can see, you have basically the chime instrument to the right, two what I'd call xylophone style uh, instruments, and then you have the drums in the green. That's a sensory garden. It's also gonna have a sandbox where they can, uh, where it simulates the archeological site and the dig. Next slide. And this is the water features. You can see the jet, the little holes in the bottom. It's basically gonna be shooting water up, like run into a sprinkler. But they did gig us and called that a splash pad. So we had to change some stuff, to meet the code of a splash pad, but you just gotta go along with the inspector sometimes. That's the water feature. And I stand for any questions, any other projects on the project update. Virginia Park is moving along, uh, waiting for the irrigation people to show up. Path. Excuse me. Go ahead, Councilor Moore. On the splash, on the water feature, um, was there a, a cost increase on the change uh, to, to to meet the guidelines from the splash pad? Did it have to be bigger, yeah. or what have what what was the difference? What it was was safety, Councilor Moore. We had to put in a a light pole with the light and camera and an emergency panic button, mm. which okay. which to me, this is just, you know, we could put a line of sprinklers out there and achieve the same thing, but uh, that was New Mexico ED caught it and then CID confirmed it. So we had to do a change order for some additional work like that. And you can see it's just, uh, 
just jets shooting up. There's no buckets of water or other stuff that some of the other splash pads have that you would be splashed by a, a, a nice considerable volume of water. It's just simple jets coming up. Any other questions, hmm. Councilor Moore? Oh. And that's the way it was going to stay, or are you going to, is, is it going to, can it be no, upgraded if you wanted more other things, no, or it's just going to stay that way? It just stay that way. There's no upgrading on this one. I mean, you're going to have a surface. We'll have two different color blue surfaces on the outside. Uh, and they'll look a lot prettier than that. What you see in the middle is the mechanical turn on, so you'll hit it. They'll run so long and then turn off. Then you'll hit it, it'll run so long and turn off. It's not continuous. And is it gonna, it's gonna be level to the ground where the kid like wheelchairs can get on it or no? Absolutely. Okay. All right, I'm sorry. I'm not, no more questions. Not a problem. That's why I'm sharing this I'm one. Just so this is a new... I'm just so excited about this. It's been waiting so long. It still seems smaller, I guess, than I looked at, but then I'm thinking, but I think it's uh I think it's well on the way, and I appreciate it finally happening. So, yes, ma'am. Any other questions or thoughts? Moving on. Jennifer. Could you come up here closer so uh, Councilor Moore will be able to hear you too? So, I want to see for you, sure. <laughs> Yes, um, the terminal parking lot is uh, coming along. Still are looking at August timeframe to uh, complete. Uh, the drainage has been a completed project. The east side water line. Was, I don't. We think. should be finished next week. Okay. Um, the next two projects, the rehab apron phase one and two, we had put those on hold till after the first of the year, or first of uh, our fiscal year. And uh, the master plan, I did speak with them today. Uh, they are, will get, will be receiving the first three chapters uh, for review and comment very shortly. Uh, PER uh, runway 17 rehab, that has also been put on hold until after, till July. Uh, we've met with BLM and the engineers that so we're getting a task order together so we can get their uh, improvements that are included in their lease. Um, they will be funding this, but it will be passed through us. Um, the rub hanger, we're still waiting on the sample uh, borings to come back. Um, the, uh, strategic plan, we will have be opening bids tomorrow on that, and we'll start evaluating them on Thursday afternoon. ILEA HVAC upgrade, everything is great, it worked Really well. They had their first session and delegates uh, were very happy. Transero, uh, they are looking at another location, so we're in the middle of negotiations on that. Um, building 650 is is down, so you'll I'll remove that. And our upcoming project will be uh, replacing the whole bars and surface painted hold signs and markings on taxiways. Um, that is actually been out. It's out for bid. We only had one bid on on it uh, for thermoplastics um, from the company out of Salt Lake City, and that will be going to council for approval. Stand for questions. Questions from committee members. Lots going on. We have a lot going on. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, solid, uh, solid waste. Committee Chair, <clears throat> committee members, um, we're back again with Article with Article Three from our solid waste revision. Some of the areas here I want we wanted to focus on was kind of get a little bit of feedback from counselors, get some input. If you go to page two, line one, I can read that for you as we walk through it, <clears throat> and I'll give you the intent. A clear five foot radius around the curbside container must be maintained for the curbside container to be serviced. If there's anything within this five foot radius, the can will not be serviced. A callback fee will be charged pursuant to section 2070, levels of solid waste fees, no exceptions, and it will be built to the water bill. 
So this is kind of a hold statement. So what's happening here is <clears throat> when we run the routes throughout the city, we'll get people that don't put their cans out on time. And we have to get called back to come back. So we have to break off the route, come back and pick up those containers, service them and then get back on the route. So if there's five or six throughout, five or six, let's say one or two, each one of them is about 15, 20 minutes, depending on how far they get. So just wanted to get some feedback from the counselor, see how you want to pursue that, so you want to look forward to that. This also ties into a system that we're looking to purchase after July 1 of a Rubicon system. It's part of the automated collection. So we'll be able to, that system will be able to take a picture of the house where it shows the containers on out. We'll be able to continue the route. They want us to come back and service their can. Um, it'll be a 20, we'll assess them a $25 uh, service fee to come back service it, or they can waive it and wait until the next pickup cycle. Any discussion on that item? And uh, I, I, I don't have one of these types, uh, uh, the curbside containers. How do they know uh, the expected time when it will be out there? Is that something that they, they just know by just, so, is it sort of like I know when the mailman's likely going to run or what is the? So on, set, on if you go back one page to page one, um, line 12, kind of gives them an idea of the window when they had, should have their pan out. We service the north side on specific days. We serve the specific days. Those, those are going to stay the same, but just they're just going to have to roll their container out. A lot of our issues is <clears throat> the truck passes. They hear it pass by. They run out there, put their can out. Hey, you missed my can. And we're deliberating back and forth. And what happens is you got five or six trucks running routes. Each one of them takes ten to fifteen minutes. Each one of them has two or three. It, it extends the the service day. So what that intones is my driver stay out later, landfill has to stay out later, so we can cover the garbage. So we're trying to mitigate that. So, but my question is, what if, uh, what, what, is there, is there a specific time frame that we just say, you know, your, your can, uh, we will be picking up between the hours of 6.30 a.m. and 8.30 a.m. from where you are. How does that work? a.m. to 5.30 a.m. So residential pickup, we cannot start until 6 a.m. Right, I see that. But so for 6 a.m., they want to have their can out. And then it depends on the route and the individual that's running the route. Some people are faster, some people are slower. We have breakdowns. Things occur in the morning of the day. You won't have an exact window when we get there. Not yet. I, I, Councilor, Chair. Councilor, or go ahead. Um, why do we go back? I don't, when I don't, when I miss mine, I just put it up because why do we go back? No, you missed the window. We were there at seven o'clock. Too bad, so sad. You see you on Wednesday. You know, and I feel you that's how I feel about it. Huh? <laughs> I, feel, I feel like, you know, you know, they come the same day. If I miss mine and I hear it, I say, oh, well, I'm going to have to go put it back on Wednesday. I didn't know y'all even came back. I, I, would, I wouldn't have called anyway, but I still feel like, you know, when they're there, they don't, the mailman don't come back twice if he miss you, you know, so why y'all got to go back? I appreciate the Santa Bank counselor more, but we try to maintain a high level of customer service and we try to service everybody the best we can at this point. Um, that's why we stay late. We extend that courtesy to everybody within the city of Roswell. So I appreciate your comments. Mr. Councilor Arnold. So um, are there no designated days? Like, is it just basically it's not every day that you're servicing this like so this area has Tuesday and Friday. Yes. Or, okay. So specific space like the north side of town has specific days and so does the south side of town. How are they informed of what days are their service days? They're it's it's already said in the ordinance been like that for a long it's been like that for I didn't get that. <laughs> so that's already been established by the city. It's been like established that for years. Okay. So they already know their their, their windows. They do like Councilor Moore was saying. They know it's kind of the window when they're coming when they're showing up. Mm -hmm. Usually, if we're late, it's because our trucks break down or something happens, or we have a new driver that area. So we're trying to mitigate. I just didn't know if you had it listed somewhere or like areas. You have or... listed on the website. Okay. Okay. Uh, because when he kind of was like, how would they know? And then I think Councilwoman Best actually pointed out something 
the time if you'll see the time on here 10 p.m and 5 30 a.m so so if you read that if you read that sentence we're not going to be servicing between that window okay we cannot do that we have to be there by 6 6 a.m is our earliest 10 p.m is the latest yes thank you so, i yield that sort of that sort of covers also an H of page two, ensuring that you have your can out before five thirty and removed before five thirty a.m. the next day. Yes, this kind of serves to the rollout containers. That's kind of where we want to go in the future. That's where we kind of codify that and getting that established. If there's any more comments, we can move to the next section. Any other comments? I was just kind of curious. What are your average cans? Your ninety-eight gallon cans were there tipped over by wind, of course, after, I understand, but somebody rummages through them. I know my 300 gallon one, people rummage through it and just throw stuff around. The ones that come out between, you know, six and nine, how often does a dog go over and knock it over? We don't, we Is have a not lot. much of an average of that. People no. don't rummage through it. It's, it's safer. Really. It's, a lot, it's a lot safer because it's right in front of your house. A lot of activities don't happen in front of your house. They'll happen behind your house where there's no eyes. Yeah. So, I don't really have a lot of complaints about that, that people are in their garbage in the front. Plus, you secure it, you know what's in there, yeah. you know where it's at. And it's I think they take baths in mind. I think they get in there and just have a good time. So, okay, just curious. So I we, do have we, a question about the area. I'm sorry, about the distance. Ahead. I do have a question about the distance. I'm only saying this because I've been in my house for 30 something, 30 something plus years. and. The the the, they, the the trash man has has destroyed the fence right there. There's a fence between my house and the next house. They won't move the trash can. I keep moving it to the street, and the neighbor keeps putting it back. I keep telling them that the reason the fence is bent is because they can't get to the trash can. And so, because they've destroyed my fence, the the trash people have destroyed the fence trying to get to the trash can. Not my trash can, because I I put my trash can far, but. I can make them, I, no matter how many times I tell them, you need to move the trash can. Maybe if you stop emptying it, they'll they'll get the hint. But but the, you, they bent up my whole fence right there, the machine has. So, Councillor, I'm kind of fishing for a question there, but I think I know where you're getting at. That's one of the issues that we I invited code enforcement to come in here with me is that we need a, when we change these ordinance, we make those adjustments, we want to be able to enforce it. We want to have that conversation with your neighbors. We want to pull out that notice and let them know, hey, this is how we're going to service it. This is how we want to do it. We want to make it efficient as we can, as, as smooth as we can, so we can get in and get out. Unfortunately, yes, you're right. We don't have an enforcement aspect at solid waste, so we rely heavily on the code enforcement side. So We have an education program online. You know, we have those videos for the zoo and whatever. Do we have an education so public information has been going out and doing some advertising, but the placement of cans really hasn't been one of them. We're mainly focused on illegal dumping, but that's definitely something we can we can loop into this when we get towards the end. Yeah, you know, we have a lot yeah. of illegal dumping out here on the base, so. Spent a lot of time over there, Counselor. Yes, sir, I know. <laughs> so moving on to page three, so this, Page three, line one. This is a this is an existing practice that City of Roswell has been doing for a while. It's it's a kind of residential uh, disability form. So the city has been doing this without it being codified. So what we do is on Wednesdays when the automated collection trucks don't run, we have a specific route where we help out elderly or disabled individuals throughout the city that don't have the ability to bring their container to the curb and bring it back. So right now, currently, we have 15 of them. And we want to kind of put the language in the ordinance showing that we want to have those qualifiers. We want to make sure that you actually need that service so we can provide it for you so we can efficiently pick up your garbage and, and help help out the um, elderly or disabled throughout the city. We just wanted to put it out there. And if you want, I can read it through you, read, read, read through it so we can kind of get some feedback, see if you want to tighten it up, you want to expand on it or keep it kind of general. There is an example in the notebook on the, on the miscellaneous form is there you can read it over this is an existing form that we ran through legal back in um november of 21 we had them kind of peruse and kind of go over it we don't want to get into too much detail of the residents for what they're providing but we just, i just want to make 
make the assessment, make sure it's it's safe for us to go there. Do you need that service? Are we gonna um, verify it? Page three, um, line one, I'll read it through. Carry service provided at no additional cost to individuals living alone who are elderly, ill, or disabled, or incapable of conveying their solid waste container to the designated collection location. This does not include entering the dwelling unit. The residents may be required to produce a medical statement of present physical condition. No carryout service will be performed if, the, if in the opinion of the director, the terrain presents a safety hazard for equipment operators or collection vehicles, the director has a right to limit the number of containers. What we wanna do is when we show up there, we wanna be able to walk up safely, walk through your property, retrieve the container, bring it out to the service area, service it and put it back safely. And this is just a discussion. I kind of wanted to get some guidance from committee. Okay. Questions, concerns from committee members? I actually believe that there needs to be, Mr. Chair, I believe that there needs to be language um, indicating that uh, participants need to actually qualify or fill out a form. There, uh, It's kind of vague. Um, the resident may be required to produce a medical statement, but they also have to reach out to you to actually even get the service. There's nothing indicating that. I would agree with that. If you have qualifying conditions, uh, whatever those may be, uh, maybe a couple of places just to think of, to reach out to think of that. I know the United States Postal Service has a similar program that if you uh, are handicapped or have uh, inabilities to, it's too dangerous for you to go down to your mailbox at the road that you can have one put next to you, but they have specific uh, requirements that you have to meet to be able to do that. So maybe take a look at what they have to offer and having a having a more spelled out re requirement may make that a lot easier on you or if you're gonna be charged of playing favoritism and you know how it's gonna go. Yes. And, uh, or, or, or you know, people abusing it as well. Uh, so I think that that's some wisdom there for sure. So could you get some language together on that and bring it back to us at the next meeting? Sure. Yeah, and I need to review that first sentence. It doesn't seem gr grammatically correct, but I'll, 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 I kept reading it. It's something about it is bothering me, so. <laughs> Thank you, Councilor. The next item that we have highlighted here is, it's kind of a unique uh, situation within the city. It's gonna be page eight, line 13. Oh, I'm sorry, let's go back page to page six. six first. Yeah, let's go to page six here first. Yeah. So page six, line four. Okay. Yeah, I'm a, a little lost at this point. Which one is that? Uh, page, five. page five, oh. line 40, letter K. Oh yeah, mine's, mine's a little bit different than yours. Yeah. Of course it is. Yeah, I'm not so let, let, letter K is, let me read that one through and we'll kind of work through this one. It's a violation of this chapter to place unacceptable bull trash items, trash exceeding five cubic yards, or improperly placed bull trash items out for collection. Responsible party must remove and dispose of all bull trash improperly placed, bull trash exceeding five cubic yards, and any unacceptable items of bulk trash at their own expense. So what's happening is, and throughout the alleys, we're getting everything out there. Mm -hmm. and, and the exit for bulk trash, you're getting huge sections of fence, you're getting metal fence, you're getting wood fence, you're getting washers, dryers, trailers, bed trucks, I mean, you name it, we're getting everything out there. So this is an area where we wanna kind of tighten it up, kind of get some guidance here of, if you're putting the outside of the bulk trash that we're, we're able to pick up, or you're putting an excess of it, you know, you're, you're kind of abusing the grapple of truck service at that point. A grapple truck holds 20 cubic yards per truck. So if you have one house that has 20 cubic yards of, of bulk trash in their alley, that's gonna fill up the truck once and we gotta go and come right back. So you wanna kind of curtail that, kind of limit that, kind of have a little bit more control on, on the way they put up that bulk trash. Let me, let me share just some, um... Uh, indigestion over over just uh, I, I'm agreeing with what you have here. I guess my problem is I, I periodically will get phone calls, not 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 too awful often, but I will, and I know that I've experienced as well uh, in the neighborhood that I live. If I uh, 
uh, you get to the fall and I start to cut off you know, tree limbs that don't need to be in there and I do it correctly and I put it in less than four feet and less than 12 inch diameter, which is the requirement. And we rake up the leaves, we put them in bags, we put them back there. It doesn't take me long to, with the size yard that I have to have a pretty massive uh, amount, but I stay within my limit, but also recognize that where it's supposed to be placed, I've also got three other neighbors that will also be doing the exact same thing. So, uh, and if it's not picked up in a timely manner, you are going to end up with a whole lot more, or uh, those bags are going to get punched as dogs are walking on top of them or whatever, and they, you know. Uh, so, uh, how do you handle that of knowing as to whether or not that five cubic feet is from one neighbor, if it's four neighbors together? How do you? Well, the good thing for the branches and grass and leaves and stuff like that, that come we can compact it pretty well inside the truck, and those are the ones that we can pick up quickly and efficiently, really fast. So those, like I said, they come back. There's a lot of airspace there that we can really compact in there. Are we getting back to the place though, to where we're able to use our grappler trucks? No, we're not. We still have 11 vacancies currently. So that that just adds wow. that, just, that just makes it for me a little difficult. I, I'm in agreement with this being here, but um, uh, you know, there, there's going to come a time where if we're not picking it up, they're paying for the service. And if we as a city are not picking it up, it's going to it's not going to take long to be more than five cubic yards. And then the city's going to turn around according to this and say, well, now it's your responsibility. When I when I as the as the as the taxpayer would want to say, well, you know, 60 days ago, it wasn't five cubic yards. Now it's 15 cubic yards because everybody keeps piling on top of it. And uh, uh so how do we handle that? So when this is written, Councillor, what we're looking at is in, if we're fully staffed, we're fully operational, there's no reason why we should not have that. So and in order to write this in anticipation of what we're dealing with now would kind of be a little facetious for us. So we want to kind of plan ahead, get, get set up in ahead of time. This is something that's going to be caught up by for a long time. So the reason when we wrote this, we're looking at when we're fully staffed, we have the program running 100%, we'll be able to provide that service quickly and actually like we've been doing for so many years. Unfortunately, right now we are in a staff shortage, so it's 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 magnified now, the bull trash program. And can I, if I can ask a question, Chair, when you ask pay, what do you mean pay? So we have we have a service. Again, I don't hear too well. We do have a service where, let's say, an individual would call and say, hey, look, I want to pay for the service. Right. We go direct to them and we pick it up quickly, but as a whole, the city, they do contribute minimally, but this program runs at a $1.1 million loss right now. I, I, I understand, but the taxpayer still is paying for a service that, that if, if, we're, if, we're, if we are uh, being a conservative, I've always said, I don't mind paying what it costs me to have the service done. I just don't want to pay for cost to have mine done and three of my neighbors done. So I don't want to be taxed and taxed and taxed just to be taxed. But if we're not, if we're not uh, charging what's necessary to, to, to provide the services for, then we need to, we need to look at that. But, uh, but we are paying for the service. If the city has chosen not to up those fees to, to where it's not in the rear, that's not the taxpayer's fault. And that's, that's what I'm looking at. It's just like with water. Doing? There was a time that uh, just driving home from uh, uh, the from work. Yeah. What happened? Just be real quick. You went today. Hold on. I have a question. Hold on. Uh, Councilor, give me just one moment. Are you needing to leave? Go ahead, Councilor. What were you saying? I was. Can you give me an idea what five cubic feet is? Is that like the size of a queen mattress? I'm, I don't know what, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, an idea of five cubic feet. So five, five cubic yards, you're looking at a small, yeah, like about the half, half the size of a small uh, compact car. Hey, you you want to look like at dimensions, like car. height, width, yeah, like a small little car. You don't want to look at the height, the height would probably be like two, three feet, four feet wide. You want to look at okay. the dimension, like three dimensional sort of. It's not as big as you'd think it'd be. Okay. No. Uh, not, not at all. But back to what I was saying there, you know, if the, ta if the taxpayer is paying for the service, there was a time when we first came, when I first came on the council, when we were subsidizing the water department unbelievably, and uh, the water rates had not been raised in what, Mike, 20 years or more? 
Yeah, a long time. And uh, in my opinion, you know, uh, the, regardless of what they were paying for water and for uh, wastewater, they expected the toilets to flush and to go out. If we had chosen not to up those rates, that's, that's not the, the, the citizen's fault. So I think that we've got to get to a place where we're providing the service that we're, that we're taxing the people for. And that's just, that's just, that's just what I want to make sure we're getting, getting to. And I'm not blaming anyone for that. I'm just saying it's where we are. Uh, Mr. Cole, are those positions still in this new um, budget? Yes. Okay. All right. Okay. Any other thoughts, counselors? Okay. Um, go ahead. Ready? Moving on to N. The city uses mechanical collection equipment for the whole time and I'll be placed for collection set for the subsection J and, and or K of the section. The director at their discretion may collect the bull trash and may require a waiver that holds the city harmless for any and all damage associated with collection activity. A waiver must be signed prior to the collection. So we're referring to here because we have a lot of vacant lots. We have houses that are empty that have an excess of bull trash that impedes the actual right of way in the alley or it's a blight on the city or it's a public health nuisance. So we need to step in there and, and remedy, that, remedy that situation. Also we have a situation where there are actually a fire as so we just wanted to bring that up, bring that to the attention of the committee and committee members, and if you have any input on that. Okay. Questions, concerns with that? Moving on. So moving on all the way to on minus page eight. So we're talking about the multiplexes, the three dwelling units or more. So within specific, within the city we found there's there's house there's complexes that have been built within residential residential apartments residential neighborhoods, so inside those neighborhoods you'll have for example we have a a four a fourplex that has two bedrooms each so it ends up being eight bedrooms sharing one three hundred gallon container and they're only paying the the base rate of twenty forty but they're sharing that with four of the homes in the neighborhood and they're over using the mm -hmm. service so we want to kind of codify this and identify all those multiplexes that are overusing and set them up with their own commercial account for their specific containers for their specific service. So we find these throughout the city that, you know, has it been changed and they're all the way, all the way throughout the city. There's, there's duplexes, triplexes, quadplexes all over the city inside the residential neighborhoods that are overutilizing the service. So we just want to, that's one issue we're dealing with pretty regularly. So I just want to bring that to your attention is, Committee chair, any okay. feedback? Mm -hmm. So, um, I, I and that makes makes sense. Except for I do have kind of one question: What if these are townhomes that are? Is it the same for townhomes that are owned by separate people? Because if this is a commercial and you have one agency, I can see that what you're saying on a rental property, but on um, multiplexes that are individually owned, how do you address that? So the ones that we're looking at here with this identify as one complex that's owned by one individual, one corporate, they own all four. The individual ones like we have up north on the north side of the hospital, those are individual towns homes that are- that They are, pay that individual. They, they pay, all of them pay individual. These- three, I would say that that needs to be spelled out a little bit clearer in the language. I, I agree with that. Yeah, you get, you take a quail run or somewhere like that where uh, you may have four units, but you've also got four separate water bills and four separate uh, uh, solid waste, uh, you know. It's uh, something like individually owned multiplexes or something like that. If that language could be. A lot of the things where when, when we look at these is that we look at the water meters, if it's a complex that has multiple meters, we'll, we'll be able to do that. But if that one master meter that fits the entire complex, it's going to be one bill. So whatever private interaction, whatever decent group they have for their trash collection, they can have that with the landlord as well. That's it for me, uh, committee chair. If it's time for any questions, otherwise we can. Okay. Questions or comments from members? Is uh, Councillor she she cleared to be able to speak if she desired to? Perhaps. 
All right. Okay. Thank you very much. Moving on to the next on the agenda, uh, Utility Ordinance 26. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is the discussion on the cross connection and backflow prevention. This will be Title Six or Article Six. Next slide. So this one's a pretty quick one. Uh, first part of it is the applicability. Next is the purpose. This article is set forth uniform requirements for and applies to customers in the city of Roswell. We're doing this to comply with state and federal laws, including the Safe Drinking Act of 1974, as amended. Our objectives is, you know, we're, we're basically doing this to protect our water system. We're protecting it from people allowing their stuff to backflow into the city system. Uh, we're using technical specifications that are already in place, including the uniform plumbing code. The next section is on responsibility. A lot of this is the, res well, if you look at the bottom, uh, let's see, section 164, Lorenzo's responsible for all of it. Pass the buck. <laughs> On the next page, it talks, you know, what the city plumber inspector does. A lot of this is the city plumbing inspector doing his regular job. This is plumbing code stuff. What the customers are responsible for, we're going to have to, we're going to kind of create a new business in town by having certified black flow prevention assembly testers and also assembly repairmen. We don't have, looking around and talking to some people, we don't have that. So at some point in time, we're going to see if we can bring in some training for, you know, the plumbing companies and stuff like that and give them the first, so we have the first batch and, and we'll provide the training to okay. do that. So the next part, 165, is the requirements. Mandatory cross connections by contaminant. And if you notice, it goes, it has different ones for non-residential, residential. Uh, you'll notice that there's different effective dates, especially on the residential stuff. We push that out until uh, 2034. This says that the existing stuff has to come into compliance. And that'll give people time as they're doing changes to their houses and stuff like that, that they can they can come into compliance. Uh, on all the new stuff though, it will be mandatory starting January 1st, 2024. And that's when we'll start putting in the, the new meter boxes as we can. We're already putting in the three quarter inch ones, the one inch ones we don't have in stock yet. So we're, we're giving everybody time one nice thing about that is that is after Lorenzo and I's retirement date. So again, somebody else's problem. Whatever. <laughs> any questions on any of those effective dates or how that works? Questions or comments from counselors? Um, Councilor Arnold. Uh, just a question on, I guess, marketing and education of the 2034 program. I'm sure you have some. We will let I'll, I'll spill the beans on this right now. We have it set up, and uh, Abraham and I have been working on this. We're going to do a quarterly newsletter that's going to go out in your water bill, and it'll have all this kind of information. Lewis is going to provide information on what's coming up for street projects and that kind of stuff. We will let everybody know what's changing in the water department, what's change, what uh, is happening at the landfill, all that stuff, and we'll do it quarterly. Are you going to call like utility or something? We're going to come up with <laughs> What I'm really thinking is the, there's a group over at Goddard High School that part of their the training that they're going through in that is creating newsletters and nice. doing that kind of stuff. I would really like to turn it over to them and see if they will do it as a class project and take it and run with it. Because mm -hmm. the one thing, if you make it interesting, you make it funny, 
people were, will remember it. And then they'll be looking forward to reading the next one. Mm -hmm. We haven't talked to them yet about that. So if the teacher's listening right now, we'll be talking to you soon. But that's the kind of stuff that at some of the meetings we've had with them, that they're looking for those kind of projects. All right, questions. And then we go into right of entry and inspections. I'm and sure Council Moore still with us. Council Moore, do you have any questions on any of that? No, I'm, I'm, I'm with it. Okay, thank you. Moving on. Then we talk about uh, how the assemblies have to be tested and certification of the testers and the repairmen, approved training courses. I said the first, the first couple of times we'll provide the training. I've already talked to a guy that one of our vendors and he's willing to come in and, and give the trainings. Uh, fees will be set forth in Article 4 and Appendix A, like all the other fees. Article 5. Article 5, sorry. Uh, violations and penalties. Some of these, you know, there's, there's some stuff in there that you have to do. And if you don't do it, then you go into 168, and it says that we will shut off your water until you do do it. Okay. And then this one does allow for a hearing if they feel that they're being picked on or something. And that'll go back to the governing body. Okay. Question. So full disclosure on this one, I plagiarized it from Albuquerque. Theirs was the most current one that I could find around and it was written very well. So that's a normal process when we find somebody who's spent their time and energy on fixing something, we, we jump on it. Yeah. All right, any questions or comments? Hearing none, thank you very much. Okay, landfill tipping fee item. Chairman committee. Go back to the picture. Basically what I wanna do is to make sure that on all our projects that are, have contractual obligations with a contractor or a third party, that we are gonna have landfill tipping fees. Uh, what you see before you is the Deming Bridge when we took it down. But on the projects where there's a bridge, a lot of concrete, the contractor will be responsible for not only the demo, but disposing of it. If they use the landfill, they'll have to pay the tipping fees. Uh, and if there's a main break and the contractor has to come in and do the cleanup after uh, the water department, they'll have to pay for the landfills. This does not include the tipping fees where the utility department does removals and hauls it up to the to the landfill. This is only the contractual uh, work that's being done. Uh, just to give you an idea, the city dump trucks, they're five yards. So if we had five yards in there, it'd probably be a $100 tipping fee. If it's a contractor's bigger dump truck, the, the, the tandem, it'd probably be a, a $200 tipping fee. If it's a big 25 yarder, it'd be probably more like a $500 tipping fee. So it's, I'll add up a little bit. So when there's a, we'll take the fire station number one, they're gonna have some work done and take part of their driveway out. So each department on their on their task order work order, they'll be charged, we'll compute the tipping fee there. So every department will be carrying their own weight. If it's an engineering project, uh, engineering will pay for it out of our capital or uh, repair or infrastructure, but it's just, it's going to be a little something, something, but it should help the landfill and the tipping fees. And uh, we'll put it on our annual maintenance every year. So there'll be an item that they'll bid. We know the tipping fees are just a handling fee they'll be associated with. I stand for any questions. Questions, comments, many members. So what about with demolition? like if uh, condemned. I know that we're most likely getting away getting away from the specific, uh, uh, specific uh, yeah, I gotta have trouble with that word, with the specific of utilizing that portion of taxation towards that and moving that just into a general fund. What is that going to look like? And I just bring that up just because we're talking about tipping these schedules that just um, what what's that going to look like? Because uh, I know we've still got a lot of a lot of very very bad 
properties out there? What's that going to look like? Mr. Chairman, uh, committed members, I, I believe, and don't quote me, but I believe there's still it budgeted in this next budget a little over $300,000 in code enforcement's budget uh, for demolitions. Uh, as a demo, uh, if uh, we're charged a tipping fee, we'll just apply that to the the lead. You know, if the contractor has to pay for the tipping fees, he's just going to pass that back on to us. We'll include that in our lien that we place on the property. That chances are very few of them get paid back. So we'll be putting it on the lien, but so we will be charging tipping fees then, and the city will be paying that. Yeah, the contractor's just going to pass them on to us. So that's just going to come out of that, that line item then. Yeah. So if we've got 300,000, um, Lewis, in that. I bet we're using that as the number 300,000. Just pulling the number out of the sky, 5%. Okay. 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 So it's not as much as what I was concerned it could be. Well, and that's what I'm saying, trying to give you. So we have a driveway. If it's just one dump truck, it's probably a $100, $200 removal because concrete, but it's mm -hmm. a lot. Oh, sure. Well, when you do a house, number one, the anatomy of a demolition. They do the asbestos and lead and all that stuff separately. Yeah. That's a separate fee. Then when you're dumping uh, all that wood and scrap, there's a lot of void with inside mm -hmm. that truck. So, okay. Did I jump in when you were going to say something no, else? I apologize. That's good questions. Okay. Again, I mean, just that clarifies what I'm doing. I'm just doing the stuff that engineering has its hands on. That's the only thing I can, can address. I can address for the other department. Uh, I'm, engineering is doing their best to help the landfill stay in the black. Uh, but you're saying that at five percent, so that would be if there's a budget of three hundred thousand, you're looking at about five uh, fifteen thousand dollars. Okay, and then that that's not a concern to me. Like what I was concerned, I, I just didn't want to see if we were able to do X amount of houses now. Now a third of those houses aren't going to be able to be dealt with, or whatever the building is because we're having to deal with the tip. I would recommend that as they tear down houses, they keep records. Mm -hmm. So we could have a feel for it for next time. So they, they videotape, they photograph, they have to have a demolition inspection done for a step system and all that stuff. Before. And that's done prior to the demo. And the day of the demo, they verify that day that the owner has not changed with the county assessor's office before the demo ever starts. But it's all okay. documented. Other questions? All right, solid waste, chapter 21, article two. So this is an easy one in your notebooks. You know, we, we incorporated the changes that were requested on the previous meeting. Um, all I'm asking for here is consensus. We can archive article two into the red line. Move on to the next. Highlighted portions will be where we made the changes that were written. So page three under general statement, the responsible party, any premises, businesses, business establishment or industry is responsible for the sanitary conditions of the premises, business establishment or industry for the proper storage, containment and placement for collection of solid waste. Solid waste must be stored in a manner that does not present a health or safety hazard or public nuisance. No person shall place, deposit, or allow to be placed or deposited on their premises or private property, any public street, alley, or right of way, any solid waste in a manner prescribed in this chapter. Questions on that? Line 23, such containers shall be provided in sufficient number to contain the amount of the accommodate and accommodate any and all solid waste accumulated by such persons between collection periods must be assessed by the director or their designee to ensure that there is adequate service. If there is found to be insufficient service, uh, if service is found to be, insuffi uh, to be insufficient service, okay, I, I get it now, I'm reading it wrong. If service is found to be insufficient, comma, Service will be adjusted accordingly in an effort to maintain the health and safety of the public and appropriate fees will be charged 
uh, per Section 21-70 fees for containers. Any questions or thoughts? Or did you need to add anything? Any comments on that, Abraham? Negative. Okay. Yep, just the addition of that comma there. You got it. Under page number four, uh, shown or in it, they will be their responsibility until the containers are serviced. That's the lids closed at all times within a kind of solid waste. Then on line 14, in addition to the penalty imposed, pursuant to, sub, uh, to set subsection III of this section, a person in violation of subsection of this section must make restitution to the city for all in it disposal costs incurred by the city uh, by fees per section 21-70 fees. Any questions on either of those? Page number five, moving on with the container for automated pickup. All cardboard boxes shall be broken down and placed in the container so that when it is inverted, it will self-empty. Okay. And then number three, at the discretion of the director, they shall eliminate 300-gallon alley service. They shall uh, then furnish 96-gallon curbside service with the following notification procedure. Remind me, um, this is at any place in the city? Yes, yeah, so these are mainly residential. Folks here. I'll say that one more time. These are mainly residential. Thank you. Mr. Chair. Yes, ma'am. If I may be honest, um, number three, actually, I am a little uncomfortable with that. Okay. Um, number one, it's very broad. Um, this kind of gives the director the ability to try to change all of it to 300 gallon alley service. Um, so I don't know if you're actually speaking of specific locations all at once or whenever you determine. So um, honestly, I'll be honest, I'm not a personal fan of 300 gallon alley service because I've experienced it and I do like alleys. Um, I understand the dilemma that we're, you know, that we have some of our alleys are too small. You come across those situations. I, I completely understand that, but um, I kind of think this language is just a little broad and um, um, I don't know that I want any director to have that, um, you know, um, kind of, that's just a really broad statement. I think it says illuminate. Eliminate. Eliminate. Excuse me, my pronunciation is incorrect. In other words, he is allowed to say no more 300 gallons, yeah. move it to the front of the house. Yeah. No, I'm understanding what he's saying, but well, what he's not saying is it for the whole city or for a neighborhood? So it's, we focus on it's specific neighborhoods. Place. So we it'll move on to the entire city eventually, but there is a specific percentage, and there were 10 to 50 percent of the alleys in the city. A 300 gallon service is best and ideal for those alleys. There's other areas that are not. The majority of the alleys, I would say over 75 percent, 96 gallon is the best alternative way to, to run the trucks because of the accidents, the accessibility, <clears throat> the power lines, cable lines, and we're causing a lot of accidents where we take out fences. Well, it's a little tail to safety, but we can we can button that up a little bit tighter if you'd like. Well, I, no, I, if there are others who's actually support it's fully fine. Here's my objection to it. I actually think that that is something that should go before council when you decide to take the whole city or to that. That that's to me that's because um, that is a call that I would probably be getting nonstop. And How did you do this? <laughs> if I can interject, I agree with Councillor Arnold, and let me let me say why. Um, the the night, there are going to be places in the city that as you are driving around, as we have equipment that changes, that we're going to destroy stuff using the 300 gallon, and it just doesn't make sense. And the 96 gallon is going to be best. But if we, uh, in all reality, those are going to be uh, a street here, an area of town there. Uh, when we get to the place, this this is very broad point. I agree that if if uh, we had a director that just said, nope, we're not going to use 300 gallon anymore. Everybody's going to use 96. Well, I guess the, the the argument could be made that the council still has authority in the end because if we don't give them the money to buy the 96 gallons with, you're stuck. 
However, I, I still think that that's a discussion that should should be heard by the council. Um, uh, we we've been through some of that before, and uh, I was surprised at how much the the uh, public came out even when we changed colors from black to tan. You remember that? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so, uh, so some people want to to be able to have their voices heard on that. So. Maybe uh, maybe that needs to, I, I would agree that that language should better change. Um, um, upon approval of, of uh, council, uh, it maybe needs to be put, they shall uh, eliminate 300 gallon alley service, um, and they shall then furnish 96 gallon curbside service with the following notification procedure. Uh, but then you can have a subsection in there that at the discretion of the director, um, in areas where there's a safety, there is a whatever those whatever those reasonings you just gave us before, I don't care. Uh, don't come to me every time you've got to take out half a block of you know right. thirty three hundred gallon. No, you're the expert, and in all reality, chances are the full council is going to take the opinion of the expert in this thing when it comes to changing to the ninety six gallon. But I think the taxpayers are going to want their 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 electors. To, to be making those decisions. So maybe a, a sub there, okay? It's just just to note, um, Chair, I mean. Yes, sir. Um, when we do target areas, they are specific neighborhoods. There are probably 50 or less. And it is because of, of safety issues or hazards that are, that are mitigated. So to cover the entire large area, to phase Roswell out of 300, you're looking at a six to seven year phased in approach. You won't. And I agree with you totally. The language just doesn't allow for that. That's what I'm saying. I think that's what Councillor Arnold's trying to say. I don't think she's against no. the, the, the concept at all, but the language doesn't allow for that. So let's make the language match what we're wanting to say. That's good. Thank you. Okay. All right, moving on, page seven, number nine is unlawful for any person to utilize the solid waste receptacles assigned to other persons for the disposal of solid waste without their permission. This does not apply to the automated solid waste system where residents share uh, the use of containers. Questions or concerns there? Out oh, paper cut. Uh, all right, anything else? So I would say this, why don't, with that, I think that, that I personally think that that is, um, that one change is substantial enough that let's wait on making a consensus till you bring that language back to us next month. Is that okay? Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, moving on, uh, chapter 26. Again. I haven't seen you guys in such a long time. So this is Article 4, Service Establishing, Changing, and disconnect, Discontinuing, uh, 130, and, and this is, we're doing the consensus to move it to red line. Uh, the purpose is to establish how we get people their services, how to change the service, how to disconnect. Uh, 131 provides that we have an application, and with that application, it, all this stuff becomes a contract with the customer. 132, infrastructure extensions. This is if somebody wants to extend infrastructure on their dime into an area. It just basically tells us how we're going to do that, and Section E is taken out. Any questions in there? Any questions? 133 is transfer of service. Uh, the second paragraph is the one on rentals that says that it's the tenant's responsibility to let us know that they're leaving and the tenant's responsibility to let us know who they are coming in. And if they don't tell us that they're leaving, they're gonna continue to get the bill until they tell us. 134. 134 is permanent discontinuance of service, and it will be done in accordance with each service, and permanent discontinuance of service will also occur if the account is closed and the meter is removed from the pre premises 
in violation of 2621 or 2622. So if they don't pay their bill, then we have to go pay, pull the meter because they keep turning their own water on. They're going to have to reestablish their service, which includes setting up a new deposit. And then restoration of service, it'll be done in accordance with each service. Questions or concerns with these in Article 4? Anything about valves that are stuck open and to where a plumber can't shut them off by chance? Is there? <laughs> nasty phone calls from people. This stuff is crap and you need to come fix it. Which did not happen. Okay. So if if there's consensus on this one, we will move it to red line. Any any concerns? So to answer that question, I don't actually have a concern. Just uh, in the last um, constituent calls that I have shared with you about kind of um, clar clarification between being discontinued and shutting off. We've, we've counseled staff on how to how to make the differential okay. you know do you want do you want to have the service on at, at, at a point in the future and if it's going to be you know within the next couple of weeks the cheapest thing is is to just keep it what it is now pay your basic rate mm -hmm. if you're going to have it off for the next six months it is cheaper to have us come pull the meter okay great that's all i needed thank you okay all right then five consensus we Move that over. We will also be taking a break. You won't get a new, a new one in your discussion packet next month because we're working on rates. Okay. We'll be working on the, the water rates and the, the the ordinance that goes along with that. So, all right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Moving on. Uh, well, management plan contracts. Lorenzo? Hey, Mr. Chair, committee members, uh, can I ask you to consider approval for professional services as Sire Miller Associates? Let me stop you for just a moment. My paperwork says that that is on page 68. It's all moved down, so it's 71. I see, 71. I got it now. All right. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Okay. After you consider approval for professional services, that's ordered with Sauter Miller Associates, phase one and phase two of the asset management plan, $50,000 on phase two GPS location services at a cost of $76,257.48. And authorization for the city manager to approve these tax orders with Sutter Miller and Associates. And a little background the city of Roswell was awarded uh, grant award number PG 6092 asset management plan on April 27, 2023, in the amount of $30,200 uh, for the cost of phase one and phase two asset management plan and phase two GPS internal asset management planning team completed the review and it is their recommendation to approve these task orders with Sarah Miller. And with that, I'll answer any questions you got. Questions, concerns? I will entertain a motion. Make a motion to send to full council consider approval of professional services tax order with Souter Miller and Associates for the phase one and phase two A management plan of fifty thousand and phase two GPS location services of seventy six thousand two hundred and fifty seven dollars and forty eight cents and authorization for the city manager to approve these task orders with Souter Miller and Associates. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Any other discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. Motion passes. All right. 
and the resolution on the asset management plan. Also those? Yeah. Uh, actually requested a resolution 23XX, consider approval of resolution 23XX, in the development of an asset management plan for the city of Roswell, directing the implementation of a complete asset management plan pursuant to the local government planning grant agreement by and between the Metro Finance Authority and the city of Roswell. Mr. Chairman, no, items number nine and number ten should go to consent. I would recommend. Oh, that's correct. Okay, who made the motion on number nine? Make a friendly amendment on nine. Second. To place on the consent. Correct. Yes. Okay. Any any uh, any one against that? Hearing none. That'll go to a consent. Number 10. Simple. It's it's just this the resolution forward. that accompanied part of the paperwork. Can't do one without the other. So uh entertain a motion. Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a motion to approve resolution 23-XX approving the development of an asset management plan for the city of Roswell directing the implementation of a complete asset management plan pursuant to a local government planning grant agreement by and between the New Mexico Finance Authority and the city of Roswell to be placed on the consent agenda. Second. Second. Okay, we have a motion. We have a second to place this resolution on the consent agenda of the city council with recommendation to approve. Any other discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. Motion passes. Anything within department reports we need to know of? Is that informational only? It's informational only. Just FYI, we finished the the hot recycling a week and a half ago. We finished the microsurfacing Saturday. So those two are done. Uh, we're milling on Washington. Mm -hmm. The rain shut us down a little bit today. And then next week we'll do a little bit of milling on garden, but uh, okay. it's orange barrel season, guys. It's get around town. We 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 have uh, two seasons here: is that winter and construction. Uh -huh. so we're opening bids June thirteenth for the washed out Mescalero Bridge. Okay, that seems to draw a lot of interest. Oh, I'm sure. Fantastic. So, public comment. Anyone? Anyone at all? Raise your hand. Anyone? Go ahead. Rita. You want me to state my own name and where I live? Uh, go ahead. Rita Kane Dorhofer, very narrow, unstriped uh, Chicago Cubs mailbox, Mark Road. And I did get something in my mailbox this morning. Somebody wanted to ask a question, and I submitted it in for file, but I did talk to because I've known him for a long time and he gave me the answer that I needed. But I have a couple of questions here. On page one, section 2129 holidays for the uh, collection and disposal. Uh, line 21, the, sh the city shall observe holidays as non-collection days. Does that mean that everybody gets a holiday off or only certain people? I think it's talking about for collection. Yes, for collection. Yes. Do people get off or are the rear loaders working on Memorial Day? Because I have a list of the holidays here, and it seems like all the rear loaders are working on holidays. Is that something that is going to change when they get their 12 CEO drivers, or is this in effect? And that's one question. And then the next question I have is, um, it says here that the director should go out and make the decisions. How come the supervisors aren't going out? Jason's been there since 2011. Philip's been there since 2014. They run routes. Don't you think that their knowledge would be much better than the director, since he doesn't go out as often? as the supervisors. Supervisors are out almost every day now. 
I'm just asking, wouldn't it be somebody who has come up through the ranks to make the decisions since they would be more knowledgeable than somebody that started in 2020? Making the decisions on? On the barrels, what barrels need to be, what if they're going to go from a 300 to a 90, or if they're going to have four or five different uh, families using one container, or if there is a duplex or a... Uh, I would say I, I would say leaving it at director is probably the correct place to put it because uh, they are looking at it at the entire city, not just a certain section of town. I would say that I, I don't know how you run your department, but I would think that you probably have drivers who bring concerns to the supervisors. The supervisors could probably say, no, that's not warranted to even be looked at. We continue moving on as it is. If the supervisor says, yep, that has some merit warrant to it, then it's brought to the director. So you're really involving from the from the low, I don't want to say the low end of the totem pole, but all are involved with bringing their portion of wisdom to the table. But if we if we leave that decision made uh, uh, you know, further down the rank, uh, you open yourself to, to, to possible problems. Uh, so I think that that probably is a director that's just my opinion on that one piece. Okay, and the holidays? The holidays. Those are commercial accounts where they actually pay for those days. So when we have a full staff, what we do is we rotate everybody on a voluntary basis first. <clears throat> then we utilize reverse seniority to service those, those commercial account payers. Okay. Pay for that service on those specific. But that's on a full staff. They are 11, soon to be 12 drivers down. But I would say it's still, even if there's drivers down, it's still done on the same basis, a volunteer first. They don't have enough on volunteer, lowest. Seniority. Seniority in the move, yeah, move through the ranks. Yeah. Seniority in the years that they have been with the city or seniority in the years they have been with sanitation? Seniority is within the city of Roswell utilizes seniority based in the city. So we, we get that list from HR. They'll provide us a seniority basis, so we utilize and we publish to everybody. Okay. Does that help to answer that question? Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Anyone else? Okay, you know, Well, it is 5.50. I will call this meeting adjourned. Thank you all. Thank you. Have a good night. Councilor Moore, stay safe. If you need anything, please let us know.